There is publicly available information on the Wyoming Game and Fish website that will improve your success at drawing a Wyoming hunting license and find a place to hunt. The experts are here to answer your questions and give you the tips and strategies to make your Wyoming hunting dreams come true. Welcome to Hunt Like a Pro, application tips, strategies, and hunt planning. This is the 14th, excuse me, 11th of 14 live events, and we have the experts here ready and willing to answer your questions. So please take advantage of this opportunity. To get started, let us know where you are watching from in the comments and any question about drawing a license or finding access. We hope you'll stick around for the next hour or so that we'll be here. But if you need to leave early, you can always come back to the recording on the Wyoming Game and Fish Department YouTube channel, Facebook page, or wyomingexpo.com. So grab a cup of coffee, introduce yourself, and let's get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Dorenzo. I'm the public information officer for Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And um, I'm so happy to be here with a couple of top-notch hunt planning experts that we have at our agency. I'm joined by um, Jennifer Doring and John Pocalis, and I'll let them both talk a little bit about what they do at Game and & Fish and why they are gonna be the best people that you can possibly hear from today to plan your upcoming hunting application. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Jennifer Doring, and I'm the license section manager for the Wyoming Game & Fish Department. So I'm responsible for all licensing for Wyoming Game and Fish and conduct the limited quota draws that you guys are all interested in drawing your license for your favorite hunt of the year. Yeah, Jennifer is, um, you know, beyond an expert at our license system draws and um, knows the ins and outs better than anyone at our entire agency, I think. So really lucky to have her here to talk with you today. Um, and then we have John. Hey, I'm John Pocalis. I'm the Casper Regional Access Coordinator. So what I do is administer the Access Yes program for the Casper region, which includes securing access for hunters on private properties through our walk-in areas, hunter management areas, and walk-in fishing areas. Thanks, John. So John is, um, you know, he's an expert in finding a place to hunt, um, public land hunting, and some great tips on how you can plan your hunt using some of these great tools that we have available on the Game & Fish website. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll take questions throughout our presentation today. So if you have a topic um, that you uh, wanna ask about, drop your questions in and we'll get to them throughout the presentation. Um, we're gonna be showing you a lot of these tools today um, and walking you through how to use them. So, um, you know, this will be a resource that you can come back to over and over and over again um, when you're planning your upcoming hunts. Um, and we'll mostly be talking about big game hunting today. And so let's go ahead and get started. Um, John, you know, I, where does it, can someone even start? I want to hunt the game this year. Where can I start planning and what should I start with? Yeah, so one of the most common questions I get from folks, um, especially if they've never hunted in Wyoming before or they're new to hunting, is you know, where do they start? How do they get involved with hunting in Wyoming? I always direct them to our hunt planner on our webpage because that does a couple of things in concert together. Um, so if we can show what I'm looking at. This is the Wyoming Game and Fish web page, and for the majority of what folks are looking for, you can access it through these five buttons at the top here. And so we want to go hunting in Wyoming, we're going to click on the hunting in Wyoming page. And so, John, uh, just to jump in a second, so you're recommending that a first-time hunter, the number one place they need to start is going to the website and going to the hunt planner. I agree. Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. You could get to this information through a number of different ways through our, our website. Um, so this public access page is, is kind of all the access yes program. So you can access all this information here, but by using the hunt planner, what that's gonna do is all of our access areas may have specific you know species you can hunt or specific regulations. The hunt planner is gonna filter all of those access areas by the species that you select from this drop down list. So we'll select antelope. 
And access areas that John's talking about are these places that game and fish, um, they, they, they manage um, in collaboration with landowners to allow public hunting at no cost. And so these might be things like walk-in hunting areas and um, hunter management areas, right, John? That's exactly right, Sarah. So yeah, all of the access, yes, areas, which is walk-in hunting, hunter management areas, are privately owned po properties that we've teamed up with the landowner and allowed the general public to use free of charge. Um, again, there may be additional restrictions, but that's exactly what the access yes areas are. It's private land that the landowner through an agreement with the Game and Fish has allowed the public to use. So- Okay, yeah, we'll talk about those a, a lot more. It looks like we're, um, so, we're going to hunt, we get to the hunt planner, and then we choose the, the species that we wanna look into, right? That's correct. So we selected an antelope for this particular example. And what we see right away is it's already gonna show you which hunt areas for antelope in Wyoming that you can select to apply for. And you have to apply by the hunt area, right, Jennifer? Correct. You have to apply by the hunt area and type for any application you want to submit for the license you would like to draw and hunt. Okay, so we're going to get into those license types a little bit later, but the overall, uh, you know, start with a with a hunt area um, that you have to you have to choose one hunt area and maybe more depending on your choices, which we'll also get into later. But here we are at the hunt planner looking at the antelope areas and in Wyoming, all the all the hunt areas are different, right, John? depending on the species. That's correct. Yeah. So that's the other question we get a lot. Anyone who works for the game and fish here, I think fields that question is whether you're looking at antelope, deer and elk, they're each going to have their specific hunt areas. So for example, we'll just click on, we can zoom in on a hunt area. You'll have to bear with my computer. Uh, it's a little lagging today, but antelope area 73 is not going to be the same for deer or elk, those all are different hunt areas. So that's why we selected antelope on that drop down menu because it's going to show us the specific hunt areas. And then all of these red dots on here are going to be our walk in hunt areas or hunter management areas. And so by going through the hunt planner, it's already filtered out every walk in area or hunter management area where we can hunt antelope, shows the date that it, it's open, and then the acres that you're allowed to hunt on it. I see, so um, if I am a hunter, I come here, I look at the whole map, I may be clicking around on a couple different hunt areas just to kind of see what's available. You know, maybe that's an approach I wanna take is based on the location, um, you know, the proximity to a town. Like how do you decide where would even be a good place for you to, to start looking into planning? Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. If if you're starting from a clean slate, trying to figure out, you know, what works best for you, and we'll zoom back out here. Um, you just have to establish those those guidelines for yourself. Like, how close do you want to be to towns? Uh, how much public access are you going to have? What are the odds of drawing the license that you're looking to put in? And you know, ultimately, it comes down to a it's generally a trade-off between public access and the ease of drawing. So, so your improved odds of drawing is usually a balance between public access, just because you're having more people put in for those areas that have very good public access and less people put in for areas that typically have a lot of private land that's harder to access for the general public. And so, you know, that's, the question that you should answer for yourself right off the bat is, do you want to just maximize, you know, your odds of drawing or what I recommend for folks kind of hit that middle ground where you've got really good public access and your chances of drawing are still pretty good. And so um, just to, to bounce a question over to Jennifer, um, John's talking about drawing the odds of drawing. What does he mean by that? So our drawing odds are based on the number of applicants we get in each year. So if we have thousands of hunters wanting to hunt this same area, as John mentioned, that has high public access, um, so it's easier to find a location to hunt, 
and we have a lot of applicants wanting to apply for that same area, your chance of drawing a limited number of licenses is reduced. And so on our website, we published what's known as the drawing odds after we release results from each draw. And so when an applicant is looking to apply this year, they will actually be looking at the drawing odds for 2020 um, because that's the most current data we have available for them. The one thing they do need to keep in mind is drawing odds are only a predictor of what could happen this year. Um, our application counts change and fluctuate every year. Hunting preferences by our applicants change. One year they may want to hunt closer to home. The next year they may apply for a different area. So those um, numbers of applicants each year do change, but mm -hmm. those drawing odds are found on our website, similar to where John directed you to um, hunting in Wyoming and the hunt planner. There's a link right below that that shows drawing odds or you can still actually find them on the map that John had pulled up by clicking into more information on a specific hunt area. So there's a diff couple different places you can get to our drawing odds um, on our website for a particular hunt area. Great, so it looks like we have that screen up here now and just continuing with the, the antelope uh, pronghorn example that John was showing us, we've selected a hunt area. Now we're in there um, and we're checking out some of that great information that Jennifer was just talking about, the, the drawing odds information. So Jennifer, in Wyoming, um, you know, mo most licenses are on a draw. You have to apply for a limited number of licenses and then, you know, see if you get it. And um, <laughs> if we're talking about residents, um, you know, can you, can you explain what the draw is like for residents for big game? So yes, so for big game, for residents, um, the biggest thing to note that's a little different that we often get questions about is residents in Wyoming, we do not have what's known as a preference point system for residents. We do have that for non-residents. So when applicants apply for the limited number of licenses for big game, as a resident, they are put into a random draw. Everybody has an equal opportunity to be randomly chosen for that license. And so those drawing odds are based on that. And that's random for all license types. When folks look at the different licenses that are available, we have a lot of different license types. And for residents, those draws are all conducted the same way? For residents, they're all conducted the same way. Um, when you look at the drawing odds that were up on our screen, you'll see drawing odds differ based on first, second, and third choice. So a little bit to talk about, um, when you submit a big game, license application, you have the opportunity to select three different licenses that you want to go through the draw, known as your first choice, second choice, and third choice. The one thing to keep in mind in Wyoming is our draws are done known as a vertical system. Um, so we look at everybody's first choice and award license based on, for residents, their lowest random number, and just work through till we run out of license applicants for that particular first choice area. And then we move to an applicant's second choice. Some states pull a person's random number and they look at their first, second, and third choice, which is a horizontal system. We are a vertical system. So you will note that the drawing odds for first, second, and third choice are different. Um, but in Wyoming, for residents, the big thing to keep in mind is it's for elk, deer, and antelope, it's 100% random draw. We do not have preference points. Great. So just bringing this all together, uh, you're planning your hunt. Um, you go to the hunt planner and like John said, you know, start looking around, asking yourself these important questions about where you want to go, what kind of access there is. And then as Jennifer explained, taking a look at the drawing odds and sort of creating that balance between uh, public access that you desire and also the ability to draw the license. And I mean, John, as you said, I mean, it's almost never those two things magically align 100% um, great public access and then really, really good drawing odds. I mean, it's, it's definitely a balance. And so you might have to um, weigh those when you're, you're trying to make your decisions. Um, so I think uh, the next thing, John, maybe you could uh, move us to the next step about uh, what people can also see on the on the hunt planner and the the different uh, tools available on that map. Yeah, and we'll jump back and forth between a couple of, of different 
screens. And just for anyone who's new, we'll, we'll kind of start at the, the foundation of interpreting this map. And so all of the, the yellow that you see, and we'll look at Antelope Area 73, which is just west of Casper, that's going to be federal BLM land, which is open to the public for hunting. The blue is represents state land, usually open to the general public for hunting, unless there is additional restrictions on it, which you should be able to see uh, on this map. And then the last thing where we were going is all of these walk-in areas. Um, once we zoom in on them, you can actually see the boundaries and click on specific walk-in areas. And then this more info tab, just like when we looked at it for um, the hunt area, it'll bring you to more information for the walk-in area, which gives you specific information on additional regulations and the dates that it's open. So it seems like for people who aren't super familiar with the hunt planner, you really keep, it's a, it's a layered system. Zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. The more you zoom in, the closer you get to, you know, just looking at that one particular area, but it's really just chock full of really good information. Like you saw the different lands, uh, statuses, the different access areas. You can see all of that by just zooming in. Um, John, if, you know, what are the, talk a little bit about like how somebody can figure out if they can access a piece of public land or not. And how, how are we allowed to get to those public land areas? And of course, are we allowed to cross corner wise on those? Yeah, absolutely. And again, this is one of the more common questions we get. And it's important to note that kind of how you access property is going to differ from state to state. So in Wyoming, all of your county roads, highways, interstates have easements across private property. And on the map that we were just looking at, you can see all these brown outlined roads are gonna be county roads. So even though they cross this white, which represents private property, the general public is allowed to, to use those roads across private property. And then we'll zoom in a little bit. And so any adjacent lands to a public road like that, either county, highway, interstate road, is going to be available to the general public to have, to access where so do i just like park on the road and and slip under the fence or how do you how is that okay yeah so generally county roads um there you're not going to have a single problem doing that at all if you're talking about highways and interstates it's important that you don't want to endanger yourself or impede traffic uh by parking a right away or off the side of the road where you've got vehicles going by at highway speeds but county roads in wyoming pulling off the side of the road it is generally an accepted practice um a lot of these walk-in areas do have designated parking areas but uh, in general county roads you can pull off the sides the fences in wyoming don't necessarily follow uh property boundaries they're usually you know for grazing practice to keep animals in in one particular uh parcel and so yeah if you're on public land and there's a fence there you can go over or under the fence however you want to get across to to access blm land great well um all right keep moving along then like show us a little bit more yeah absolutely and so yeah, that's public land. And then it's important to note, you know, people talk about two tracks that you can drive your vehicle on. Those don't carry the same easements as county roads. Uh, so if you're on a two track, it's not gonna show up on this map, but you wanna access this portion of the walk-in area and there's a two track that, you know, cuts across right here. That's not gonna have that same easement that a county road does. So you're going to have to drive up or access it from this BLM or up here where it's adjacent to those public areas or public roads. And I guess moving on, um, and as far as corner crossing in Wyoming, in general, it's we try to discourage folks to do it. There's not a, a hard set precedent on it yet. And it may vary from county to county is how those local law enforcement agencies enforce that. So that's just something you should reach out to your local game warden or uh, sheriff's department 
to determine how how they interpret it, interpret corner crossing on on public land. Well, thanks, thanks, John. Um, the um, the next thing I think that we should talk about um, is just with the the next stage of hunt planning. I mean finding a, a little bit of uh, accessible public land or where you want to hunt and then thinking about, you know, where you want to hunt in Wyoming. Those are um, two steps that we've gone over. But if we find an access yes area that we really like, how do we know if we need to, what's the process of getting onto that land to hunt? Um, you know, and what's the difference between a walk-in area and a hunter management area if we're looking at those areas to make a plan? Yep. That is also a great question. Yeah. So for example, Antelope Area 73, we've got a lot of walk-in areas. Uh, we don't have a hunter management area, but we'll look at one of those next. So for walk-in areas, you can see is designated up here as walk-in area number 15. As long as we have an antelope license, we're accessing it between the dates that it's open, and then we're adhering to any additional regulations, which may say you know, vehicles restricted to designated roads or established roads or foot traffic only. And in this case, there's no additional designation for vehicles, which means it's going to be foot traffic only. And you'll see that on the signs when you actually get out on the ground, each uh, walk-in area is signed appropriately in that fashion will say foot traffic only. And for that case, all you need is your, your hunting equipment. Uh, you don't need to contact the landowner or need any kind of permission slip. And you're good to go as long as you're within the uh, additional regulations of that hunting area. For so that, that's pretty easy then. So what you're saying is as long as we have a license that's valid in that area and the walk-in area is open, when it, you know, when it comes hunting season, that's a place that we can know that we can go and hunt. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, thank you for distilling that. Cool. That's right. And so then the next part is about those hunter management areas, which we know is like a little bit more of a layered process that people have to kind of uh, plan for, plan for, plan for. That's absolutely right. And so hunter management areas are a little bit more controlled than walk-in areas. So to access those, you do need a permission slip, which you get through our website and you can get through the apply or buy button up here or what I always direct people to do um, just because it puts them a couple steps ahead. So we're going to look at Muddy Mountain and Antelope Area 32 right here. And so you can see as we zoom in, we see the boundaries of the Muddy Mountain Hunter Management Area. We can click on that again. More info is what we want. We can see we can hunt antelope, deer and elk on this particular hunter management area. Wait for it to load. And each hunter management area is gonna have a specific set of ranch rules. We'll have a map for you available here. And it's important that you read through the ranch rules because they do vary from ranch to ranch, hunter management area to hunter management area. And so for hunter management areas, you do need a permission slip. And you can see this apply for this HMA. If we select that, that will allow us to apply for the HMA. And you can only do that once you've actually been drawn a license for that area. So when you go to apply for an HMA, it's only going to show you hunter management areas that are applicable to the license that you hold. And these don't cost any money. Um, some are on a first come first serve basis, some are on a lottery, and some are unlimited in number. But you do need that permission slip. And once you receive the permission slip, print it out. You'll notice there's two copies of it. One of those you'll keep on your person while you're hunting. And the other one we would like you to put in the dash of your vehicle while you're hunting so that as we patrol those areas, we know that each hunter has the correct permission slip. Great. Well, that is a perfect um, place to just pause for a second and maybe take some of the, the questions that have come in. Um, our uh, friend Chris Martin's here. He's helping us out with uh, forwarding your questions on. But then, do we take a couple questions? Um, we'll move on to some of this 
um, you know, we're feeling pretty good about, you know, where we might want to apply now. And uh, we can talk more about the actual application. And Tina, you have a great question that will will get us right into this conversation, which is, do we pay our um, tag fee or license fee up front when we apply? And so, Jennifer, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, what the expectations are, what you need to know when you sit down to go into the license application process. Sure. So once you spend a good deal of time on our hunt planner, as John mentioned, and you know where you want to go hunt and you have a good idea what you want to apply for, you're going to get into our application system. So it's important to note um, during the application period, you're going to click on the apply or buy button and then you're going to click on apply for licenses. We're in an application period. And so once you get in there, Yes, you are required to pay your license fee up front, so you will pay the application fee. So for residents, the $5 application fee you'll submit, as well as the license fee for the license you're applying. So for a full price antelope, you're gonna pay that fee at the time you submit your application. And then if you're successful in drawing that license, we'll publish those drawing results, you'll go check your results. You'll be excited because you drew that license that you've spent all this time planning and worked through with um, the hunt planner, as John mentioned, and we'll mail you a license. Um, if you are unsuccessful, we will refund back that portion of the license fee. So the application fee is non-refundable, but that license fee you paid up front, we will refund that back to the credit card that you use to pay for that application after the draw results are posted. You should see that refund back on your credit card um, within 10 business days of those draw results, um, okay. usually. Great, great. So, um, and the reason that we do this, the reason that we charge people ahead of time for the license is to reserve it for you. Um, you, When you apply for the license, you pay for it. And if you draw it, it's yours. And um, uh, that's that's why we have you pay up front. Um, so what else do people need to know when they, they sit down um, sit down to do their application they you know like john pointed out and talked about we we definitely have to know the hunt area that we want to apply to um right what else do we need to know yeah so it's it's incredibly important that when you get into the application system you know what licenses you want to apply for so when we talk to customers in the telephone information center we talk to thousands of applicants a month um, the first thing we tell them is you have to know where you want to apply um, so encourage them all of the steps that John walked you through. Once you get into our application system, um, the first thing you're going to notice if you haven't been in there since February 4th is we have a new secure login. So you will be required to create a user account um, with the department, um, which is a username and secure password. And that's like a lot of different websites that people go to. I yeah. mean, and you, you create a username and you create a password and then um, that's how you'll access all your um, game and fish information from your application system to your permission slips and then also um, things like your tooth aging results if you need to look at those. And so it's really handy and it consolidates all your information in one place. Yeah, it's a great, exciting system we've been looking forward to rolling out. Um, so it's very exciting. So yeah, once one you, other thing though, Jennifer, don't you need an email address? You do need an email. So it is important you have an email. Um, if you don't have one before you get into the system, you will need to set up, you know, Gmail, Google has free Gmail, Yahoo has free email. There's lots of um, free email accounts out there that you'll just need to go create one. And the reason that's important is if you forget your username or you forget your password, we do have ways that you can proactively reset those yourself, but you do need an email. So just like conducting business on Amazon or any of you know, your favorite sites that you purchase your hunting equipment, Cabela's, Bass Pro, um, you have to have a user account and to do business with them, so. Great, okay, so we've got, we have to have our, um, we have to know, which I kind of forgot at the beginning, you have to know which species you're applying for, you yep. have to know the hunt area, and you've got to have your username and password, which requires you to have a, an email address. So, okay, we're in the system now, we're, we're all caught up with our username and password, then what happens? So you're going to get in, and one of the first screens that's really important is we have to identify your residency. Are you a Wyoming resident? Do you meet the residency requirements? You've been in Wyoming for one full year, or are you a non-resident? 
And really what that does is then the next screens that we present you in the application system will display the licenses available, whether you're a resident and non-resident. And really where that's important is some of the general licenses for general elk or general deer. And um, John let us down antelope, which is really simple. Um, all of our licenses for antelope are available to residents and non-residents. Um, so once you get through so your let's residency. Just, let's stop there for just one second um, and, and talk about that point, Jennifer, because what, uh, what, what Jennifer is indicating is antelope is all on a draw, um, but there is a, a nice um, advantage to being a resident in Wyoming, which is we have general licenses for deer and elk. And I, I just want to toss this question over to John. John, um, you know, what, what is a general hunt experience like in Wyoming for uh, deer and, and elk? Is it, I mean, is it still a good hunt or, you know, what's the benefit of a general license? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, just back up a little bit. And so general licenses are licenses that you can purchase over the counter in Wyoming. We give out that general licenses unlimited in number. So and every for resident only. For resident residents, only yeah. Every resident in Wyoming who's eligible to buy a hunting license can buy one general deer license and one general elk license, right? That's correct. Everyone can. Okay. That's really cool. I mean, that's really cool. That opens up hunting opportunity for pretty much everyone who, who wants to try and uh, put some big game on their table. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it can be a great experience and it gives you an opportunity. You can still put in for your limited quota license. And if you don't draw it, uh, you can purchase a, a general deer license or elk license. And there's still a lot of opportunity for, for general licenses in Wyoming. And, and a general a license help makes you able or allows you to be able to take the, the buck or the bull or cow, calf, doe, fawn, right? It, it, it's typically antlered. Uh, again, that's going to vary by what hunt area you're in. There may be an antler point restriction in some places that may say, you know, for deer, it's three points or better. Um, and you're just going to have to look at that information. Again, that's also available in the hunt planner. Uh, we'll pull one up for a general area. We'll look at number two, which is in Northeast Wyoming. And we're going to blow up this screen a little bit. You can see general for general deer. Uh, in area two, it's antler deer off private land, any deer on private land. So if you're hunting on private land, you could take a doe or a fawn. Uh, if you're on public land, which includes BLM, forest service, or state land, um, that additional reg or requirement, it has to be antlered, comes into play. But yeah, these are great hunt areas. It's important to note that because they're general areas, and you can see um, through our hunt planner, you can click on it and you'll be able to tell whether an area is general very quickly, just based on the more information box. But uh, you just need to set your, your standards for what kind of expectation you have for that hunt, keeping in mind because we give out a lot of general licenses, the volume of hunters is probably going to be a little bit higher. So how can you kind of moderate your hunting experience to reduce the impacts of overcrowding in those areas. And I always encourage people to kind of shift their hunting window temporally, uh, look at a Tuesday through a Thursday rather than Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it may improve your hunting experience by reducing the amount of hunters that are out in the field. And again, look at those access yes areas, uh, look at the public lands and always encourage people to reach out to private landowners too, because that's another area um, that you can improve your hunting ability, get away from some of the, the crowds. And uh, these are tips and, and tools that people have used for years and they're still effective now. Great. And Jennifer, you, uh, you have a big game brochure with you. This is our hunting regulations book. We put one out every year, changes every year. So you should always get a new one. 
Um, but inside that hunting regulations book, it does list out the sort of restrictions and limitations that John was talking about. And so it, the way it works is it goes by hunt area. And if it's a general license, it says general on the, I think it's called the, the um, hunt area. And so, but uh, with a general license, if you have one, you can hunt in any general area that's open. And so those season dates will be listed um, on that table. So you might be able to bounce around for several months all around the state and hunt every general hunt area you want as long as it's open and you're following those restrictions and you haven't harvested yet. So lots of good opportunity. Um, something that I've always thought was nice about the general license is if you're a new hunter, it kind of allows you to explore the state a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit of low risk because like, Jennifer was saying, you don't have to apply. Um, you can you can buy it over the counter. And so if you're new to hunting, a general license might be a great way to explore what you like a little bit more before you, um, you know, try to enter the draw for one of your top areas. But travel around the state, see what kind of access is available, see what you like. It's a really, really good option for new hunters. Um, so just to, to bring us all back together now that, you know, there's a couple other license types in addition to the general, and we've been talking around those a little bit, but I think we're ready to hear more about what are these license types and what do they mean and what do we, what do they cost? So, yeah, so we have um, many different license types. So the norm, the one you'll frequently hear, and once you've determined what species you want to hunt and where you want to go hunting, a couple other things you need to determine is what type of license type you want to um, apply for. So type one, type two, type three, type four, five, and nine and zero are considered full price licenses. So full price deer, elk, or antelope. And those are typically your bulls or your box or the limitation of any elk, any deer may have those antler point restrictions that John was mentioning. Um, and then we have reduced price um, or DOFON, which are your type six, sevens, or eights. Um, and so when you go to apply, you're going to select the button and the application that you want to apply for based on that type. So once again, a general one, two, three, four, five, nine, or zero is going to be the full price. So you're going to select that button. You're going to pay a higher fee. Um, for those licenses, because you get a lot, they're the buck or the any elk, any deer, or the reduced price, which is the six or seven. Um, so it is important to note when you're applying, you can't have a first choice of a type one and a second choice of a type six. Those are two separate applications in our system and conducted as two separate draws. So that is important to note. Once you figure out the species you want to hunt, the area you want to hunt, you get next need to kind of determine what you want to hunt as that type. Um, the next question we always get is, why do you have so many types? Mm -hmm. um, and that really goes back to those regulations. Um, there's usually specific limitations on those um, between a type one and a type two. They may have different season dates. They may have different limitations on them. So it is really important to use the hunt planner or the regulations to see, um, you know, are they private land only? Are they a very short window? Um, mm -hmm. Type threes typically for deer or white-tailed deer only. Um, thing to note for elk, really important, is the type fours and fives are full price licenses. You pay a full price for that license, but they are antlerless elk. So basically you're hunting a cow or calf, but you're paying a full price. And that just gives management, wildlife management flexibility um, for additional seasons, but those are considered full price licenses um, when you pay for the fees. So that is something important to note when you apply um, in the initial draw for elk. Okay, yeah, um, that's it. That's This is an excellent point with all these different license types. I mean, the reason that we have these is not to be confusing or uh, to make it difficult for folks to apply, but they do truly have a purpose because hunting for Wyoming has a purpose and that's wildlife management and hunting is a tool that we use to manage wildlife. So these different license types gives um, biologists and game wardens like John out there who are um, trying to meet these objectives um, 
the, the flexibility to do that in a way that we can, um, you know, manage herds so they're in the, the right population areas. And these license types allow us to do that. And so when you apply for a certain license type, you're hunting, you're having a good time, but you're also contributing in a big way to wildlife management in Wyoming. So that's why we have all these different license types. And it can be confusing, but that's why folks like us are here to help and talk you through those choices. So um, Jennifer, another thing that you've mentioned that is really important is that you, um, you know, you have all these different license types, but how many licenses can I even apply for when I sit down there, um, you know, by the deadline? What can I, what can I, what can I go for? So you are allowed to submit one full price license and one, um, an application for a doe fawn um, for each of our species. So um, if you're doing elk, you can submit one full price elk license and one reduced price cow calf application. For antelope, you can submit and one application for a full price antelope or deer. And when you do the doe fawn deer or antelope, you can actually apply for a quantity up to two in the initial draw for doe fawn antelope and doe fawn deer. So if you really want to get out there and hunt, you can submit six applications um, by the deadline. Um, so something that we talk about a lot here, and it's very important when you go to make your applications are these, the idea of a first, second, and third choice. Jennifer talked about it a little bit at the beginning, and that was kind of hard to wrap our heads around because we didn't know a lot yet about our application system. But here we are now where, you know, we have our um, location, our types, our hunt area. We know what we're doing, but now there's three choices. Um, I wasn't planning for three choices, Jennifer. What do I do here? So if you have the one coveted area and that's the only place you want to try and hunt this year, you're just going to put in a first choice. Um, an application doesn't require all three choices. You can put a first choice only. You can put a first and second choice if you maybe have two areas that you would consider hunting. So I have to think about two different areas. So if I, um, you know, I choose, I would say I want to hunt deer area 60. That's my number one place. I want to go there. It doesn't help me to put deer area 60 type one for all three choices, does it? It does not help you. Okay. Um, there's no advantage to that because as I mentioned, we're a vertical system. If we reach your random number on your first choice and give you a license um, and there's licenses available, you would have got it on your first choice. If we don't get it on your first choice, we'll never get it on your second or third. Get it. So, so it doesn't make sense for me to do that. And it also doesn't make sense for me to... Um, put in a second choice where there's no chance of drawing on my first choice, right? That's correct. So that's also the importance of those drawing odds. If there's less than 100% chance of drawing that license on your first choice, you have 0% chance of drawing that on your second or third choice based on prior drawing odds. Um, so it is important to study those drawing odds so that you're making um, wise choices when selecting those licenses. Um, Sarah, just one thing I want to point out, mm -hmm. though, say you, you really want to hunt Area 60 and there's two different license types. Your first choice could be 60 type 1 and your second choice could be, if there's a type 2, 60 type 2. Because they're both full price licenses. They're both full price licenses and they're different licenses. So you could apply for the same area, but have different first and second choices on your type. Mm. So that's very important when you're studying that hunt planner to look at those different license types as well. But you just wouldn't want to put 60 type one as your first, second, and third choice. Got it. And so the other piece is I can't put, I can't say I want to go for a buck deer in 60, a type one, and then say, well, if I don't get that, then my second choice should be 60 type six, a doe fawn. I have to do two separate applications for that, right? That's correct. Um, but there is something because we do know some of um, both our residents and non-residents, if they don't draw their full price license, their buck license, they may not want to make a trip clear across the state for that doe fawn. So when you submit that application for your doe fawn, there is a box to, that you're allowed to check that says, if I'm unsuccessful in getting my full price license, my buck license, please withdraw my doe fawn applications from the draw because you don't want to have to drive clear across the state if you don't have that buck. So we do give you that option when you're applying for those reduced price doe fawn applications to withdraw that if you're unsuccessful in drawing your full price. Got it. Okay. So, I mean, we have our choices. We're ready to submit. Um, before we submit our application, I just want to see, are there any questions out there about our 
application system and how we planned our hunt to this point. Chris, anything? This is some great information for first time hunters in Wyoming, says Tina. Thanks. That's what we're hoping. We want to get you feeling excited and confident. Like you can go do this right after we, uh, you know, get off this presentation and, and start planning your hunt because, um, you know, the deadlines are kind of creeping up on us, right? The deadlines are creeping up on us. So I'm just going to say the deadline by regulation is always May 31st for um, resident elk, deer, and antelope, and then non-resident deer and antelope. Um, if it falls on a weekend, you get an extra day. So this year you get till June 1st, but please don't memorize that date. Memorize May 31st um, every year. Well, and uh, you don't want to wait till the last minute because that can be pretty challenging. We got a question here. It said, John, this would be a good one for you, I think. Um, if I draw a permit for a hunter management area and it's bordered by public land, either state or BLM, that is normally not accessible, can I legally access that land through the HMA even if it's not included within the boundaries of the HMA? Corner crossing excluded, obviously. Uh, thanks for that question, Joshua. Um, John, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? No, that's a really good question. And we get these types of questions all the time. Because oftentimes, I'm going to approach this from two different uh, situations. What uh, this person asked is, if I have a permit to access a hunter management area, so I'm, I'm legally allowed to access the private property with, within that hunter management area, I can hunt that. Can I access this BLM property that had I not had this hunter management area access, I wouldn't be able to access legally? The answer to that is yes. So you would be able to access that BLM land as long as you you have your HMA permission slip and you're not crossing any any private land that's not associated with the HMA, you can access that BLM. And then kind of to, to piggyback off a similar question that I get a lot of the time is oftentimes there's BLM or Forest Service property within the boundaries of a hunter management area that you can access legally. And so a lot of people ask, do I need a hunter management area permission slip to access that property? So as long as you're not crossing any private property to access that public land, you don't need the hunter management permission slip. That boundary was just drawn to help make it a little bit more clear by using a fence line and it may have incorporated some, some BLM or forest service. But yeah, the second you cross private property, you need that permission slip. If you want to access public land, you have that permission slip that's adjacent to a hunter management area, you can access that as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that um, you know, that's a great point that are the portal to more public land in in a way. And so if it if it's a border um, and you have permission to go there, it opens up a lot more public land opportunity for you. So they're an excellent program and they're supported um, a lot by the donations from hunters like you. So thank you for um, your support for that program. And you can see how it really um, helps people do their DIY um, hunting like um, every year and for a variety of species, not just big game. But um, so Jennifer, moving moving right along, we have all of our choices in here. We have our access plans. We, we have a pretty good idea. We're going to press submit. And uh, then what happens? So once you have all your hunt areas in, I think it is important to note in when you submit your application, you can make a donation on your application to access yes, which does fund this access that John has been talking about. So. Um, we have our donation screens right there when you submit your applications that you can make those donations for Access Yes, which funds all of this access that John's talked about today. Um, once you do that, you're going to then, you know, get to the credit card screen. You're going to put in all that important credit card information so we can charge your credit card and get your applications in the system. A couple of points to make note of. You're definitely going to want to make sure you get that receipt once you get our credit card system. It's gonna say your payment was successful, but you're not done yet and click back continue and it'll take you to your receipt page. Um, it is often disappointing to talk to customers who think they got to the credit card system 
Um, but when they go to check their draw results, their payment hasn't went through, their payment may have been declined, they may have misentered their CVV code off the back, and they just have hit submit and didn't really wait till the next step. And unfortunately, their application wasn't paid for. So strongly encourage you to make sure you get that receipt. That's your record that your payment was successful and your application will go through the draw. So you just get a receipt. You don't get an email. Lots of people get confused. Like they're going to get a confirmation email in Wyoming. We don't send you a confirmation email. That receipt is your confirmation. So um, get to that and save it. And then several weeks pass um, between when you submit your application and when you find out the draw results. And we notify you that the draw results are posted on the website. And um, then it's, uh, it's your duty to go check those on the website on draw results day. Um, you can do that by how do we do that now with our login portal? That could be a little bit different, huh? Yeah. So once you know, you get the email that draw results are going to be posted. They're on our website. You're just going to log back into your account, that username and password that you created, and go to the draw results. And it will show up right there whether you were successful in drawing that license. And it will actually show you if you had a first, second, or third choice, which of those licenses you were successful in drawing. That's awesome. Okay, so we have, um, it looks like about nine minutes left, and so we'll take some more questions here. All right, can you get a general tag and a type one or two? Uh, Jennifer, do you wanna take Brandon's question on that? So it depends on the species. Um, so you cannot hold a general elk license and a type one or type two. Um, actually that's elk or deer. Um, so you have to pick one or the other. So if you are successful in drawing as a resident, your type one license in the draw, um, then you can't go purchase a general elk or deer over the counter. Got it. Because um, they're both full price licenses. They're both full price licenses. Um, and so you are limited to um, one general, one type, one, two, nine, zero. There are, are rules for what you can hold, and those license types um, are a little challenging. Um, but no, you can't hold a general and a type one or two. Great. So um, something that I've been dying to ask you guys this whole time that we've been talking. I mean, and I'll, I'll shoot this question to John, but I'd love to hear from both of you. For um, Can I be successful on a hunt if I can't go out for any on on the ground, boots on the ground scouting? Can I can I be successful in a hunting season with the, the tips and information you gave me today? I would say absolutely. And, and people do it every year. And because like we looked at the walk-in areas and hunter management areas, we know we have those specific dates that we're allowed to access that walk-in area. So typically we can't go before season to help scout and try to pattern animals. But that being said, there are a lot of tools available to us to help us put us in the best position to be successful uh, during the hunting season. And a couple of those are, I mean, use uh, Google Earth. You can really easily identify habitat types and help kind of narrow your focus on where you want to hunt by just saying, you know, where meadows are, where food sources are, where likely bedding areas are for whatever particular animal you're after. And then in addition to that, I would reach out to those local resources that you have at your disposal being, you know, the regional game and fish office, the local game warden, your local biologist, and they should have some pretty good information to help set you up for success on, you know, the start of hunting season. Great. Thanks for mentioning those local folks, John, because I mean, uh, Jennifer and I, we work in Cheyenne and you work in Casper, but uh, there's a lot more places to hunt in the state. And sometimes contacting those folks who are working on the ground every day in those areas um, are a key, uh, a key resource for some really good information. And um, Jennifer, you mentioned um, the the telephone information center that we have here and the folks that work um, in that telephone information center, they're experts on helping with application questions like you've been talking about today, right? That's correct. Um, you can give that number a call. That number is 307-777-4600 and speak to one of our representatives. And like I said, they talk to thousands of people. Um, they can answer your questions. They're um, very familiar and experts in the hunt planner. They can walk you through that. Um, they 
are kind of the first line contact for game and fish. And I would just like to add one other thing um, that you and John mentioned about contacting those local resources. Um, the earlier in the season you do that, or even before hunting season, the better. Um, those folks are very busy and you're one of a handful or more hunters contacting them. Um, so the earlier you can do that to give them time um, to reach back out to you, I know they appreciate that as well. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we have one last question coming in here, it looks like. So you may or may not be able to corner cross depending on where you are and who you talk to in the day. That seems legit. Okay, well, John, can you, you know, explain why we have this, like, you know, this kind of loose, <laughs> loose answer to that? Yeah, yeah, and I, and I sympathize with Ryan there. It's, um, it's kind of a gray area. It, it's not going to change depending on, you know, what time of day you talk to somebody or, or who you talk to. It changes by jurisdiction. Um, some legal entities may interpret the regulation a little bit different than, you know, one county. It may be enforced differently than another county. It just, it is a little bit of a gray area and it's not necessarily, it's not a game and fish regulation. And, it, it, it can be tough. And some counties, they may treat it as a trespass. Some counties, they may not. The difficulty is you're trying to identify a point on a landscape uh, using a handheld G GPS device that may be accurate within 30 feet. And there's just a, a lot of wiggle room there. So like I said earlier, your best bet, you can reach out to your local game warden, they can give you guidance on that or your local sheriff's office and they'll they'll help clear that out for you. And then that'd be what I would encourage folks to do. Sure, and, and when in doubt, ask for permission, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Great, well, we have covered a, a ton of information today and there's a lot more available on the Game and Fish website, a lot more information um, to you. And if you want regular hunting information and tips, sign up on our website to receive our email. Um, but otherwise, I'll toss this back to Catherine, who's been our ho great host today. Catherine? Thanks, Sarah. And John and Jennifer, uh, this was super helpful. Um, and there's uh, some other folks out there that think this was helpful too. We have a nice comment from Old Outdoorsman on YouTube. Um, and so to you, we wish you all the best of luck in submitting for your hunts in 2022. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, here's your last chance. Uh, and then we'll go back to Sarah for some other resources real quick. Um, but while we're waiting, we've dropped a link to an evaluation in the comments section. And please just take a minute or two to fill that out. Uh, we'll also mail you this really pretty uh, limited edition sticker with a cutthroat and a pronghorn, uh, enough for your whole family if you wanna fill that out. So um, I see there's a few more questions. There's one more question or statement that came up. And then Sarah, do you wanna talk about your, the, the screen we just saw? Sure. Uh, it looks like Stan says uh, that there's some resources from the attorney general available. Um, and, uh, you know, people are, uh, you know, like John said, encouraged to go uh, contact their local game and fish folks and the local county law enforcement to get some clarity. And as always, if there's a risk of trespassing, ask for permission um, because that is the, you know, the, the most ethical standard when you're out hunting is to make sure that you ask for permission and um, it helps you just have some peace of mind, feel relaxed and know that you're doing the right thing. Um, so there's, you know, lots of lots of land out there available for you to hunt. And so, um, you know, it's this is this is one of those questions that we get all the time. And we hope that um, folks can feel confident with uh, just by asking for permission to navigate the land so that they'd like to hunt. Um, but what you'll see here on the screen are some essential links that will keep you headed in the right direction. These are really the top resources that we talked about today that we believe are going to set you in the right direction for hunting. Um, and we'll make that available to all of you. That's a, um, just an outline of a few of the resources that we have on the Game and Fish website. Um, 
And looks like we are about to wrap up. So thank you very much. And have a wonderful day and enjoy the next expo session, which I believe is uh, a kokanee session uh, about how to catch kokanee and all the stuff that Game and Fish in Wyoming is doing for kokanee salmon in the state. So thanks a lot and we'll see you again soon.